encourage you to uh, pause at the table and let's uh, get going. You've all been good enough to turn up on time, so it's my job to make sure that this moves ahead at a sprightly pace between now and 10.15. My name's Nick Gowing, and uh, this is really a brainstorming. If you've come here to get over jet lag, um, then this is not the place to be, because this is very much a working environment for the next uh, 75 minutes, and I want you to see it um, in that spirit, because these are really very challenging issues of uh, employment and skills. And we're still looking for new, great new ideas, both from the current generation and the next generation. And that's what this is all about. We want sharpness of, of focus. We want originality of ideas. And we want economy in words as well, if you can do that. There are television cameras here. I should tell you, I'm not doing a BBC debate here. That's because it's being webcast um, around the world. And already, we're getting feedback from outside this room to show that, first of all, it's on the record. And secondly, there are others who are concerned about what you're going to come up with in the next 75 minutes. And we could just quickly go up and see the kind of things that are coming in, including from the governor of the Reserve Bank of, uh, of Zimbabwe. Uh, you can see it number three up there, the tweet. Um, fix youth unemployment. Why not change the definition? That's the kind of interest and concern there is out there, including from uh, Zimbabwe. And I don't really have to underline the enormity of the challenge. We'll hear from uh, David Arkliss and also for, from Fouad in a moment uh, about the kind of scale of the challenge. Let me just add one personal note. I find it extraordinary we're still discussing this issue in this kind of way because uh, I remember the Arab De Human Development Report of 2003 in which they predicted uh, 80 to 100, the need for 80 to 120 million new jobs. Otherwise, um, there would be a crisis. Of course, there is now a crisis. They were urging um, massive political initiative, and they called it, quote, a ticking time bomb. Well, already here in the last 24 hours, I've heard the ref reference to a ticking time bomb. The trouble is the time bomb is still ticking after 10 years. So see it in that spirit because we're talking about an estimated 75 million young people out of work worldwide, and we'll hear the metrics short, uh, shortly. There really is a gulf of expectations and delivery, as we'll be hearing. There's a political overhang uh, as well, which I want to, uh, to, uh, to underpin the kind of discussions you'll be having at your tables, and we want to put into the uh, electronics and digital space as well. Let me just remind you, this, of course, is nothing like the first discussion of this kind. This is the next iteration. Um, the B20 Task Force on Employment was formed during Davos 2012. There's been a, a, a GAC as well. And there's a group of CEOs and business organizations of the G20 countries developing recommendations with related commitments. And this is really the next stage before the plenary tomorrow at 10.45. And let me just remind you of the five key points which are already uh, in the mix, if we could have those up here, for the B20 task force, five recommendations. Firstly, to commit to strategic infrastructure investments to create uh, and enable uh, job creation. Secondly, implement credible structural labor market reforms and policies to enhance labor market access while maintaining sustainable social protection systems. Thirdly, facilitate growth of SMEs and innovative business models. Fourthly, improve collaboration between business and education institutions, post-crisis curricula, targeted skill development, skills matching. And fifthly, scale internships and apprenticeships. Look at those five words, commit, implement, facilitate, improve, and scale. So what we're looking for is even more game-changing ideas. Let's hope we somehow in the next uh, 70 minutes can break out of the mindset. Now look, you can engage around the table as we're going to do shortly, but there's also another way which I'd like you to be engaged in uh, using your iPads or your iPhones or whatever pad you have uh, in your hand or sitting on the table. Um, instead of catching up on emails or doing your office work, I'd like you to use that little bit of uh, technology in your hands to contribute to this discussion. And what I'm going to do is create a cloud of concern as it develops in your minds 
um, as you sit at the table. So please, these are the addresses that you can email, even if it's only a few words, a couple of sentences, because then I can use it to inject into the discussion uh, at, at an appropriate time. And be imaginative about the kind of ideas you might have. Who do we have in the room? We have business leaders from around the world, public figures, including the Minister of Planning and International Cooperation from Jordan. We have global shapers, aged between 20 and 30, the generation that is deeply concerned and we should all be deeply concerned for. Uh, that's the new uh, shapers community uh, from the forum, young entrepreneurs selected because they are already shaping our future. We'll hear from three of them shortly. And the Global Agenda Council representatives and other experts selected because of work you've already been doing on business and growth related to the World Economic Forum and elsewhere. We'll end the conversation at 10 past 10. You'll get to your next uh, appointment. And uh, there are two others I'd like to introduce you to. Uh, first of all, we need to work out what we've been discussing by 10 past 10, and Wilmot Allen, Rapporteur, Wilmot, stand up, can you? There, is, Wilmot is going to actually try and summarize in two or three minutes, right at the end, what we've done and what we have not done, and what the message is. Uh, Wilmot is uh, founder of One World Enterprises from the US and a young global leader. Wilmot, thank you very much. And also Jody Heyman. Where are you, Jody? Uh, great, Jody over there. I'm going to turn to Jody on two or three occasions and say, Jody, are we being radical enough? I can give you a hard time for not being radical enough, but I'd like to hear from others as well. And Jody, who's founding director of the Institute for Health and Social Policy at McGill uh, in Canada, is also chair of the Global Agenda Council on Education and Skills. And Jody, I'd like you to sort of say, look, you're still not being radical enough if that's really the way you feel. Before we get going, 90 seconds, introduce yourselves to whoever else is on the table. 90 seconds, please, go ahead and uh, just make sure you know who you're sitting with for the next uh, hour. Right, uh, you won't have discovered everything about everyone who's at your table, but I hope you've at least broken the ice 
and you'll find out more. Uh, but let's move ahead because, as I said, time is of the essence. And I apologize if you're getting to the really interesting part about one of the colleagues on your table. Let me, before we go to David Arkless um, and also Fouad Aladin uh, from PwC, who are going to just set the scene uh, about the latest metrics and the latest data, how worrying it is. Let me just give you an idea of the kind of uh, other views that are coming in from outside the room. You can see the tweet stream up there. Um, number four, Europe should first and foremost create a conducive business environment through government policies to attract investors. Up above that, number five, start by giving the young hope instead of debt cages and bring things down to a more localized level. And then we can go up to uh, number 11, radical change in the curriculum for schools and universities to allow rich education experience and build future leaders. And number 13, no help by the government would help. That's what's on the mind of those who are monitoring us. And please feel you can contribute as well. Let's put the, the address back up. David Arkless, can you help set the scene, please, in a maximum of five minutes? President of Corporate and Government Affairs for the Manpower Group. Uh, in a sense, Nick, I don't need to set the scene. Just about everybody that I know in this room knows exactly what the issue is. 75 million uh, registered unemployed youth around the world, probably 200 million underemployed young people, which is a disaster. It's a tsunami just waiting to happen for our next generation of workers. For instance, in Europe in the next 17 years, because of demographics, we lose 50 million workers. And yet we're creating an underclass of long-term unemployed young people that are not fit to come in to the workforce. And that is just Europe. Huge unemployment issues in youth in the United States. Just returned from discussions with the Chinese government. One of the fastest growing problems they have in China is that young people cannot get access to the workforce, especially in rural areas. And this is going to become an integral part of the 13th revision of the five-year plan, how to put that right. Whatever we do, we've got to come up with some solutions. And there are great things out there. In the Arab world, with huge unemployment organizations, uh, Jamie is here today, like Education for Employment, putting young, long-term unemployed Arabs into jobs. So there are some great solutions out there. My own industry, human resources, staffing and recruitment, we've made a commitment over the next four years to put 10 million young people into jobs. But I'm sorry, we as an industry are just scratching the surface. Somehow we need to break through this issue. We're also co-chairing from my company the B20 initiative, trying to bring to governments, to the shapers uh, of the world, top economists, big businesses, some solutions that they can take and implement. But they need our help from this room today to come up with some practical solutions. Nick. David, before you sit down, how willing and how able are the, political, the politicians to understand the scale and to confront it in the way that you just said? Well, the numbers are straightforward, and most politicians, the last time I looked, could actually read what they were uh, seeing in front of them. However, the political reality of a place like Europe, North America, and other places does not really enable the political paradigm to put into action short-term implementations of real hard projects that get the job done, with some exceptions. And as you very well know, because I think you just came back from Germany, or were looking at that, organizations and the government are partnering in Germany to do some quite spectacular things on youth employment issues. We need to take those, we need to globalize them, and we need to do it very, very quickly. How much are they likely to listen to a message from a meeting like this, given the politics of what they have to confront on austerity and everything else? I think they're likely to listen to the things that come out of initiatives like the B20. So if we can feed into the B20 process anything today, and lots of people in this room have access to the G20 meeting, then we might see some action. Thanks, David. So remember that. That's why you're here. And remember, do if you want to on the iPad or iPhone or whichever phone you're using, please start contributing because we're trying to gather those. Even if we don't discuss them all, at least they'll be on the record. And now's the time. This is the get-go. Fouad Aladin, uh, Middle East Managing Partner and Head of Market. Some of the metrics you're seeing in the region. And a microphone, please. Microphone, please. Thank you, Nick uh, and David, for setting the scene. I'd like to zoom on the Middle East. And if you look here, in the Arab world, we have the uh, youngest population. 
in, in terms of demography, where 50% of our people are less than 30 years old. So you can see why uh, we are having some unemployment, especially uh, with the youth. Next slide, please. As you can see, we have very high unemployment already. However, when you look at the youth unemployment, it is much higher. It's 25% of all the youth that are ready for employment are unemployed. And that, that really is a result of the youth population and many other things that we will talk about. The next one is, talks about some of the symptoms of why this is happening. Again, in the Arab world and in the Middle East, we have 31% of the people believe that they would like to work for themselves. I mean, this is much higher than Western Europe, much higher than the CEE. And that is really some of the symptoms that are uh, causing some of the issues uh, with the unemployment. Obviously, there are many other things. And I have to give you a few things that I call the over 50%. When we looked at the statistics for the Middle East, there are a few things that are over 50%. One of them was that senior, and this is based on a survey that was done for, uh, for em employees, 50%, more than 50% of the people believe that senior management uh, does not easily relate to young employees. 50% of the people don't think that employers are doing enough to really help diversity. And when you think that only 20% of female youth are employed in, the, in our region, compared to 42% globally, you know, this is a real problem that needs discussion and needs a uh, solution. Again, another 50%, more than 50% of the employed in the Middle East are looking for other jobs. I mean, this is a fascinating and dangerous um, statistics and information. The lack of skilled national labor force. Again, we face that in most of the GCC countries within the uh, Middle East. I mean, uh, these statistics tell us that there is an issue. There are problems with this uh, thing, and I, I hope we can have um, uh, on discussions on, you know, at the tables on how do we deal with some of these issues. And these are, I mentioned them because they are different than the rest of the world. When we talk about all these 50%, the rest of the world is around 20, 25, so we are different. We have a, a different symptoms for employment of the youth in the Arab world. Thank you. Thank you, Fouad. Uh, and you will be discussing in a moment, but let's underscore the generational element of this. Uh, there has been a, uh, an essay competition, uh, which, and we have the, the three winners here. And what I'd like to introduce you to is their ideas for how to change the mindset. And let's go to May Habib, first of all, if we can, May. I've asked them literally in a minute, I know it's pretty brutal, to summarize what they've said, uh, particularly um, on the way the mindset can be changed and the paradigm can be changed about how you create work, skills, and employment. Thanks, Nick. Thanks to the IFC and the SA competition for giving us the opportunity to be part of this conversation. I think um, this 14% that was uh, just up there, 14% um, of Arab youth actually look at a future um, job being virtual is amazing. It's double the European number, and that shocked me actually just now, and that's actually what we wrote about. We wrote about allowing young people to find very high-quality jobs via web-based um, and uh, freelance employment online. Um, it's, 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 the word freelance is, um, is sometimes used as a derogatory term, um, but really when a uh, employee overseas brings a collaborative mindset, they become just as crucial to a team um, as if they worked in the same office. And so we in our essay talked about how we use uh, shared workspaces, um, always on connectivity, and how you can very specifically use tools to train for a collaborative mindset in virtual teams as a way for young people to create their own jobs. Um, and certainly in the Arab world, we all saw the 31% of people who would like to work for themselves. And so those two things together, um, I think, can help, uh, help the region um, fix this problem. But critical, May, to what you uh, identify in your, in your summary of what you've, you've done is the virtual nature of it. Yes, because you know, the, 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 the idea is to connect talent wherever it is to opportunities wherever 24-7. 
Right, thank you for that, that heads up on, on your work for uh, Cordoba, uh, founder and chief executive uh, from the UAE. Now let's move on to Vadyada Prabodesi uh, to, for a minute summary, um, uh, Vidya, of what you have done as a manager, managing trustee of LeadCap India. Oh, you're here. You're on a different table. Okay, here we are. I believe that uh, the problem of unemployment is as complex as a problem of poverty. It has different issues and very complex issues uh, in itself. Uh, so multiple issues like you know lack of edu proper education or an outdated education system, lack of skill development, uh, maybe corruption involved in it. So these are the very complex issues that are involved in unemployment. And I believe that addressing one may not really solve the problem of unemployment. We have to address this in the one go but there is a lack of uh, problem in terms of addressing this all. So I would really concentrate upon two highlights that, that I have addressed it is in terms of providing uh, a lack of uh, or uh, improving the outdated education system and as well as uh, uh, matching uh, the demand and supply of talent. So these are the two things that uh, it's really the need of our, we should be focusing on that. Uh, in terms of uh, addressing the issues of outdated education system, uh, I have addressed uh, this issue in terms of by providing uh, very skilled development programs uh, in, in cooperation with industry, which is needed up by the, uh, the talent part of it. And in terms of uh, uh, matching the demand and supply part of it, we should uh, have create platforms which allows industry to interact with youth more often. Thank you, and Ravi Subramanian, uh, who is Siemens graduate program member, um, again, one of the winners with this idea and what you're doing at the moment. Hi. Um, so let me give you a statistic. 90% of the workforce in India and Sub-Saharan Africa is in the informal sector without any employment benefits. Um, they don't have any contract. They can be hired and fired at will. So we need to create employment opportunities for uh, people in the informal sector. And how the global community can do that is by uh, creating a common platform for organizations who are working in the sector to collaborate and pool their resources and knowledge so that you know, our resources can be more efficiently utilized at a global level. Uh, secondly, we need to create uh, common standards for employability. Uh, so uh, you know, to reduce the asymmetry of information between uh, prospective job seekers and prospective uh, employers. Uh, thirdly, uh, it's important to encourage self-employment. So uh, youth who are being skilled also need to be financed to help start up their own enterprise. And these are youth who have no resources. They are non-bankable. So it's important to create a fund which would uh, you know, back these youth. And later on, these youth can, of course, go to microfinance enterprises as well once they scale up. Thanks very much. So what I'd like you to do now is consider some of these issues. And let me give you an idea of what some of you have already put on the table. In fact, uh, we, we just heard from Vidyada, and you can see number 32. What you've uh, suggested is encouraging commu computer programming. Business development that does not require large startup costs, but needs entrepreneurial support. Uh, there's a lot which is be we're beginning to group in terms of skills uh, and entrepreneurship and motivation. That's the kind of language that's beginning to come through, including from uh, table two from Jonathan Holstag. Uh, there are uh, quite a few emails from you, Jonathan, um, about uh, the way you see things developing. I'm just showing you that we're getting a lot of messages from you and people outside to try and create the cloud of concern and areas of focus. Can I ask you for the next 15 minutes to try and focus on your table what can be taken forward and how, and then we'll come back in plenary. So can the discussion leaders please lead the discussion and please keep messages coming through. Don't leave it to the end because time will run out. So uh, could one of the global shapers on the table be sending messages and updating us on the kind of thinking that is on your table so we can begin again to group it. 15 minutes, please.
Sorry to keep the pressure on you, but uh, four minutes, please. Four minutes. And can you file any ideas um, digitally as well? One minute, please. One minute. If, you, if there's anything more you could just put in a one-liner uh, digitally, that would be helpful.
Okay, could I encourage you to uh, just cease your discussions? I'm sorry to keep the pressure on you, but what I want to do is try over the next 30 minutes to make sure that we're, we're identify, identifying where the trends are beginning to come from within this room. And what we're already seeing um, is about the confidence of taking risk, that being an issue. The issue of culture, the issue of motivation, and also con many concerns out there. But there are some particular points which I'd just like to uh, highlight for you. And number 47 on the tweets, creating jobs does not mean adding jobs to the already existing. It means creating new fields and equipping youth to fill them. Moving on to uh, 57, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know who's in the room and who's not in the room because of the handles, or if you can identify yourself as in the room, it would be helpful. But I want to just come back to May, and if we could get the, the, um, the microphone across. 57, creating virtual offices at home through cloud, which helps create jobs in rural areas and increasing opportunities for women. And I'd like to open this out for further discussion because that's built on by uh, number 39. Interesting that Arab youth predominantly want to be self-employed and 14% want a virtual job. To me, this is a sign of distr distrust in presumably the current um, uh, landscape of job creation. May, how does that correspond to what you've identified in your company? And perhaps others could come in here um, number 57 was written by uh, Khaled, another global shaper who is in Saudi, and I don't think he's in the room, but um, created a platform to create, um, to help Saudi women at home find freelance jobs, and it's a great platform. Um, we set out to find the best writers, editors, translators, designers um, for the content creation that we do, and we didn't say that they needed to be women, we didn't say that they needed to be young people, um, but the, the overwhelming number are um, young women, actually. And I think it's a function of um, a highly educated Arab women, um, middle class, lower middle class, not necessarily being um, able to work outside the home, not just for cultural reasons. Logistics is, is an issue as well. Um, that's something that was identified in Jordan, just getting to your job. Um, and so I think the, the uh, tweets that you saw really uh, point to the fact that virtual employment, especially for educated women, um, is something that uh, is, is, is badly needed. And I don't know of too many platforms that are right now creating those types of jobs. But interesting that Arab youth predominantly want to be self-employed. David, can you, is that the kind of metric that you're seeing? Um, in our work that we do jointly across the whole of the region, uh, we're finding um, people want any job they can find right now. But this issue, I think, is one of the most powerful things in the Middle East and Africa. It's the propensity of young people to be interested in and want virtual work. And that's going to be hugely impacted by access to technology and access to capital. So those are two key issues for expanding out virtual employment throughout the Arab world and Africa. Would anyone like to come in on that? Let's, let's build the discussion. Uh, please, microphone here. And who else? Over on table nine, please. Table nine. Let's just concentrate just here. Whoa, 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 whoa. On table six behind you. Here. No, table nine and table six. My name is Karim Sabak from Booz and Company. I want to go back to the observation uh, and your question about the youth. And virtual yeah. unemployment, or on, virtual on, employment, I on, should say. On employment in general, their single biggest priority is to find employment. When you ask them what is important in your life, and we've run that survey in, across the Gulf Corporation countries, finding a job is priority number one. They end up being self-employed out of necessity, not out of aspiration. And, and there is a big difference between that, because that is today telling us what is driving their motivation. Now, we would like them to be self-employed, you know, as a general guideline. But they're not there yet because they're, our community, our society is not willing to tolerate the risk that comes with self-employment and with the potential failure. So I think there is a paradigm shift that we need to entertain here. Well, exactly. On, on, on self-employment, I would say that the key challenge is to get people off the lines for public service employment and into, into doing their own businesses. And the key challenge here is how do you embed that in among the student body at universities? 
Today, uh, one out of every three people in Jordan is either in school or in university. And they will be out there at the end of the day in a few years and uh, no jobs in the public sector, that's for sure. Um, this is where internships or bringing business to the university becomes the essential thing because we cannot talk about uni reforming universities if you really don't bring businesses to the universities. Uh, internships, entrepreneurship programs, Bringing big business to work with faculties at universities is key and essential here. Let me just keep, ask you to keep focusing, and David says this is a very important point. And Fouad, you might want to come in as well. The issue of how you create virtual employment, virtual skills, whether that's critical or not. I put it up for discussion. I'm not giving you an idea of the way you should decide. Who's got the microphone next? Hello, my name is Saad Khan. Um, Real quick, I think I have two examples of companies that I'm involved with that are actually doing this. So one is a company, it's actually a nonprofit called Samasource, who connects US-based jobs and work at Facebook and LinkedIn and Yahoo and Google, et cetera, with um, youth and folks who are actually fulfilling it all over the world, from northern Pakistan, which is where I'm from, um, in Africa, in the Middle East. It's actually a really interesting model, kind of leverages the mechanical Turk side of it. The other is a company called LiveOps, which again, operates only in the US, but it's an interesting one to look at. It's a distributed workforce. It's actually a distributed call center. So every time a call comes in, um, it actually gets routed to usually a mom who's sitting in Iowa or in Wisconsin, who then is the perfect person to actually do the sales job for that particular type. So it could be a pizza call, someone delivering a pizza, but the person who's actually taking it is not in the pizza store itself. They just happen to be really good at upselling pizza toppings, where it's all the margin in the businesses. So it's actually a really interesting way to think about this. Um, and it works very well. This is a, you know, north of a $100 million business. And, and it actually employs over 30,000 people um, in just one distributed model. Who's got the microphone next, please? How do I talk? Yeah. Um, I think the 14% on virtual jobs in North Africa, the Middle East, is probably not feasible, in my view, in the short term. But I think uh, using the virtual media for other things, vocational training and indeed training and education virtually is, has a huge potential, which is not at all being explored. One of the issues we have in the MENA region right now is clearly, right now it's been building up over the past 20 years, is the quality of education, which has been plummeting. And that is something that can be addressed virtually. But we have to see where this economy is on the value added chain. In order to propose that 14% of jobs in the near future would be able to come virtually, you would have to establish where they are on the value added chain. And on average, I believe North Africa certainly is not there. Thank you. Right. Um, Cornelia. Uh, th this applies to both virtual and non-virtual jobs. I think one of the problems we have in the region is that you, everybody wants to go to university, and not for every job do you need to go to university. It's actually economically quite um, expensive. And we need to create a change in attitude so people do apprenticeships, people can get skilled up um, for jobs that they really need to do. That goes for virtual jobs, it goes for real jobs, but it also comes with an attitudinal change, not so that you can't find a wife if you happen to be a plumber. Um, because we, we also need plumbers. And the other one is we want entrepreneurs, and, we need, and that goes again for virtual and for non-virtual jobs. We need the en enabling frameworks. We need the right laws. Uh, it needs to be easier to create a company. We need bankruptcy laws in, in, in the region. So you can, you can also fail. And another thing we need are um, centers where you can help, be it virtual, and they could be virtual actually, those centers, where you can help young entrepreneurs with accounting issues, with legal issues. And that would be a great thing to do virtually. Mohamed Elissas Mohammed from the American University in Cairo. The 14%, I see it as a sign of the problem rather than an objective by itself. And the problem be it the complete collapse of the social contract, either with the public institutions being able to provide jobs or with the private ins uh, institutions that are seen more as uh, predatory and uh, part of the problem rather than the solution and monopolistic. In uh, a study that I conducted in Jordan, 66% of the youth said they uh, are more likely to trust a person over an institution, be it private or public, uh, 8 and 5% uh, respectively. And of these 66% that are more likely to trust people, only 22% of them said people are trustworthy. There is a complete collapse of a trust culture in the Arab world taking place now. 
as, as seen uh, by the recent events. So to me, I see it as, 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 as a manifestation of the problem that exists rather than an objective by itself. Um, David Ignatius from the Washington Post. In periods of, of high um, public unemployment, rising unemployment among youth, uh, historically, there's been pressure, especially in this part of the world, for government sector job programs. And so uh, it's been the case in, in so many countries, Egypt, go through the list, that uh, these pressures have created massive public bureaucracies and jobs that take a generation to unwind because they weren't well created in the first place. It would be so much better in this jobs crisis to think about creating access to capital, to, to think about creating ways that smart people with good ideas can create companies, can create wealth, uh, and just embarking on a different trajectory from the one that we remember in the, the state sector, state organized solution to job, job problems. David, before you give up the microphone, you tweeted, B business needs more confidence, but for confidence, business needs to see job growth. Well, you know, I, I had another part of that uh, tweet uh, that, that was over 140 characters, which was plus ça change, plus ça canes. Um, the, uh, the, there is a basic, you know, in the United States today, in, in this part of the world, there, there is a business confidence, animal spirits problem, and when are business going to get more confident and, and create the pathways to job creation for young people? Well, they'll get more confident when they see that the economy is growing and there's greater demand, and well, how are you going to get the job growth if they're not investing? So this is, this is a problem well known to, to uh, to economists, I think the answer is basically the same, enlightened go government policies. I just would underline that enlightened government policy in this case seems to me to push towards creating access to capital, not uh, sta state bureaucratic jobs. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm Robert Lawrence from Harvard University. I, I just want to, us to think a little more about virtual jobs because I think what people want isn't just a job. A lot of people, particularly the youth, want a career rather than a job. And if you start to think about a career, a career actually often involves you learning from others, interacting with others, working as part of a team, as opposed to simply having a job. So I'd just like to put this on the table. I think for some people, virtual jobs are terrific, giving them the opportunities to work from home, uh, have more flex time, and so on. But I think for a lot of our youth, the real challenge is giving them careers. Let me just pick up on that because I have read May's paper. And May, um, can I come back to you, please? Because what, what you're saying is that people are making a career out of having a virtual skill, even though perhaps they didn't two or three years ago think that would even offer a hope of that. Can I just check with you? I mean, you need to read the paper, I have to say. I'm just summarizing it probably rather inadequately. But you're saying that there's an enormous explosion of potential in this virtual environment. It does become a career. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm glad uh, you brought that up because there is kind of a, a side uh, Twitter conversation going on about how you help young people find their passion because that's the first step because once they have a passion, then they build a career, then they find their job. Um, but uh, it starts with helping them figure out what they want to do. And but just to pick up that point, can you make a career out of, of virtual course, employment? 100% because it's, it's about... Um, online and offline, it's about learning how to learn in a virtual environment. Um, we have developers in Egypt, Lebanon, and Syria, and we've Skyped four or five times just in the last 12 hours. So um, it's, it's, it's not about having to be in the same place. And I actually think we're more efficient not being in the same place. Just let me get a reality check here, if I may. David and Fouad, is this on the agenda of the Global Agenda Council or not? Virtual work. In other words, is this a, a, a good avenue to pursue over the next 15 minutes? Yes and yes. Thank you. Okay. Right. Fouad, do you want to add just something here? A uh, microphone, please, for Fouad. On virtual. Yes, I mean, for sure, uh, uh, especially in, in the Arab world, where in certain countries women have difficulty working or finding jobs, virtual jobs become the only solution. And that's, I think, why uh, youth female were the most participants in this. But I'd like to go back to the first recommendation of the B20, which said build infrastructure. And that is extremely important because yesterday we had a session on infrastructure and basically one of the recommendations was build infrastructure but make sure 
that that infrastructure does use local content and does use local labor and create jobs in the countries where it is being done. Thank you. All right, but can I still push this virtual Florence Eid? Thank you. I'm Florence Eid from Arabia Monitor. I think um, some brilliant ideas have been brought up, and I completely agree, Nick, that virtual employment is an opportunity in our Arab world today, in particular uh, in the part of the Arab world where women aren't completely free to, to go out and work in, in public spaces. And I'd like to speak about our region for a moment. Uh, some of the issues we're discussing this morning are ones we have been talking about as economists for, as you said, Nick, about 12 years now, since the uh, first Arab World uh, report uh, came out that, that signaled that there was a, an unemployment time bomb that was ticking. I disagree with you on one point. I think the bomb has gone off. It's not ticking anymore. This bomb has gone off. Because the bomb has gone off through what uh, we're looking at and, and calling the Arab Spring, there are opportunities today, and I think the task at hand is to try to distinguish between what is logical and important to do and what's being discussed and has been discussed for many years and where the opportunity lies today. Governments have been jolted into action and the private sector is willing and young people, as we heard from the CEO of Cordoba, know exactly what is required. Uh, and, and what I would like to see us zero in on here is what's different today and where are the opportunities immediately implementable over the next couple of years as we take advantage of this momentum that's been created for the first time in 12 years. Thanks, Florence. Move the microphone forward at the back, please. Have you got a microphone? On table nine, please. Table nine? Table nine? All right, well, you can come first, and then table nine will get the microphone, please. Karim Salah from uh, Gulf Capital. There was an interesting tweet that the first job is always the hardest job. How can we convince employers to take a chance on the young uh, new job seekers, essentially. And maybe the government has a role there in the sense uh, maybe they can provide uh, training subsidies, tax subsidies, or uh, they can uh, provide the wage uh, subsidies. Uh, there's an interesting experiment in the UAE where the government is willing to work with the employer and split the first year's uh, wages with the employer until the employee gets productive. So it's a way to encourage employers to take a chance on new job seekers, essentially. Thank you. Let me keep pushing the idea of virtual employment or virtual uh, retention or virtual uh, occupation. On table nine, do you have the microphone now? Um, yeah, I actually have a point on access to capital. Um, to create an entrepreneurial ecosystem, which is creating jobs, you absolutely need capital. And one of the issues in this region and many of the countries around the world is that the capitalist is in small groups of families and hasn't been what I call democratized to a broader set of people who need to do the investments because this has been the way uh, business has been created historically. So we need to train people how to do angel networks, venture capital. We need to build the skill sets into that. So I think if government and the partner with the private sector can do more to train existing capital holders how to spread that wealth out further to invest in small businesses, I think that would be a very effective. And I'm with the Department of State, the US government. We have programs to train people how to do angel networks and such to democratize. And while you've got capital. the microphone, the link into virtual work as well. Okay, no, can, you make that, can you make that limp, well, you know, link one, given the capital is needed? That linkage. In fact, one thing we're doing is we, we've got a mentoring network that's virtual um, as a platform to link existing entrepreneurs and investors with um, people, um, it, with entrepreneurs locally so that they can get that access to capital. Thank you. Can you pass the microphone back, please? Um, thank you. My name is uh, Salim Eddy. I uh, work for SAP, software company. So uh, virtual is real. 14% uh, is only the tip of the iceberg. This is going to grow much, much bigger. Do you have a metric? Do you have a, a, an idea of the scale that you can see coming? Um, well, of course, uh, as I say, we have a, I have a hammer, so everything looks like a nail. We're in the software business. We create jobs every day, and we, uh, through our ecosystem of, of partners, and there is a multiplier effect. Every knowledge job that is created can create up to five others in, in, in the market. But look what's happening here in this forum. The tweets are taking over. So no, they're not. We're in control. <laughs> Let's, you may, you may feel overwhelmed, I'm not. I'm not at all. But, but, I, but look what pleased. it's done to stimulate the debate, which is important. Which is fantastic. And I embrace this, and I think this is the element of change that is needed. If, if only a forum can be created where all the stakeholders can meet, we all know who are the stakeholders. This, this has been you know, discussed for the last 10 years, 
and we know exactly what the solutions are. And, uh, but the problem is to find the right forum where everybody meets and innovates. And what I'm suggesting is, is a platform that is technology driven, where every, uh, an organically grown um, platform forum where everybody meets and innovates. If the tweets are in control, I'm making sure that you're aware of them so that you can make that kind of contribution. Let me go right to the back, please. No, one moment, please. The lady at the back. Yeah, okay. I'm uh, Zeynep. I'm a shaper as well, so I'm going to completely echo what uh, May has been saying. Virtual offices and virtual career, absolutely. Um, I'll give you two stories. Um, I'm working with people living in India, and they don't have to come to my office, and I'm serving an entire uh, country in Turkey with you know, lots of different clients. I was just talking to a headhunter friend of mine, and he was trying to convince this uh, new graduate of a university who's serving 200 different uh, companies as their social media expert. Now, did we have social media experts before? No. So virtual offices and virtual careers, absolutely. And this is moving at extreme velocity. So uh, that's going to happen before we even decide if it's going to happen. Are we, though, on, on, the, on the cutting edge in the reflection of what we're, what we're saying this morning? Are we reflecting that very high velocity which is happening out there or not? Reflecting in our discussions? Well, adequately. Are we, are we engaged? Do we understand this, sitting in this room, the speed of what, what is I happening out there? I don't think so, because um, this comes a lot from the youth as well. So, you know, the university students and what, what they want to do, uh, virtual careers. Um, I think m maybe we need to try to understand the youth better. And the idea of virtual headhunting, I mean, can, is that, is, is that a, an important area for somehow pooling skills, capabilities, and availability? Yes, I sit in my office in Istanbul, and I um, send out uh, requests across China, India, Turkey, and uh, whoever is giving me the best services, I go with them. And obviously, their career as to what they have been doing so far is, uh, is very important. To my All decision. right, one of the other things coming through here in the last seven or eight minutes is motivation. Let's try and uh, morph the two together. You have the microphone, and we'll get one here as well, please. One last thing on the, uh, the virtual careers and jobs. I would say a Can lot you talk about a virtual career yeah, or not? Yeah. Yes, definitely. And the reason I'm t talking that is today technology is enabling that to happen. If you look at uh, comparison with what's happening in today's world, even within organizations, remote working, and the services industry has proven this, remote working is a reality. And hundreds and millions of jobs are created where people work out of remote locations and technology is enabling that, not only in terms of IT services, even in terms of R&D, which is happening uh, with, remotely, uh, with remote connectivity. So virtual jobs are real, careers are real, and organizations are actually making this work. And it is not necessarily when we talk about virtual working, it's working from home. So that's the point I want to make. Thank you. Please. OK. Uh, Sophia Kelmanidis with Ernst & Young. Uh, last week, we had an internal meeting. And we were trying to understand a little bit more about what motivates our young executives. What triggers off them wanting to, su to succeed? And there was a study done by a group of young executives we think are future partners. And what came out of that was that they have totally different as um, what they expect out of a career, meaning that working long hours or being traveling away from their families was not really something that really triggered them wanting to stay in the profession. So that, I think, the, the aspect that was being discussed before, understanding what our youth really want from a career is very important. And what they understand is appearing to be different from what our generation actually expected from a career. Just before I go on to three or four others who want to intervene, Jody, can you just give us a reflection? Are we being bold enough? Uh, as you sit there, we've got about eight or nine minutes to run. Can you get a microphone? Microphone to table 10, please. Well, I, I think we're being bold enough, but I, I do have a few reality check thoughts on this. Yes, please, quickly. And on the others. Um, virtual clearly addresses a lot, addresses mobility, addresses access to work. Uh, we've heard one reality check about careers. I actually don't think we could possibly know enough, given how long there's been virtual work, about what will happen on careers. We have to address that. Another reality check we had at our table with virtual is social protection. That was related to the informal economy, but we have to worry about this. Interestingly, it was raised by somebody from HelpAge. These youth one day will need pensions. They will retire. So thinking about that, 
Third reality check, we heard a mention of education on these virtual jobs. They need basic skills. We've got so many schools where teachers don't show up, where teachers show up maybe two out of three days, where there are 100 to the classroom, where there are no books. Those are not going to be the people going online. So that's a piece. Last, last thought, are we being radical enough? We've worried about one population, but we have to worry about the other populations who are not in work. Uh, women are out of work at this age at much higher rates. The disabled, broadly speaking, any kind of difference, out of work 80, 90% in some countries. And a quick question, of course, are enough uh, of those who are vulnerable connected in this new virtual environment? Do they have the bandwidth? Jamie McAuliffe. Hi, I also wanted to put a little bit of a damper on the virtual um, jobs. Most of the young people we work with, I'm with Education for Employment, don't have access to the internet. So they are most concerned with just getting connected to that first job with the right skills. And we, we really have to still make sure that we're focused some of our efforts on that. So I love your, the way you're pushing the virtual jobs as one new direction. But let's not forget that there are a vast majority of young people who are just trying to get connected to that first job, and we need to help them do that. Secondly, I wanted to come back to your first point, Nick. We've been working at this for many years, as other organizations have been. And this is now my third WEF, where we've talked about new ideas, new policies. And there, there are actually a lot of things that are working on the ground that we haven't figured out a way to scale up. David mentioned this as well. We need real, active, measurable projects that can be scaled up. And there are people and partners willing to do this. We, need so, we could borrow from the, the health sector. We need, you know, like the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, trying to affect the lives of a billion people, a multi-sectoral, multi-hundreds of millions of dollars from multilaterals, businesses, putting together the money and the resources with shared objectives to affect the lives of millions, if not billions, of people. We need some effort like this for youth employment. It's that big a challenge, and I'm not seeing any traction for that kind of a global youth employment fund that would be driven, I think, mostly by the private sector, um, but would, would need to be uh, established soon to address this problem. But let me put to you, you say maybe a lot of people are not connected at the moment, but should it be a planning ambition, given the speed at which we've had underlined right from table 10 there, about the speed of change, this enormous, uh, velocity, that actually it has to be on the planning matrix because it's going to happen sooner than most people expect, even in the countries which currently are not well connected. Yeah, I think we've got to move from the reports to a very concrete mechanism um, that's global in nature and, and is really a platform for partners, multi, uh, you know, multilaterals, businesses, and nonprofit implementing partners like us to really address this uh, problem at scale. The great thing is a lot of the discussion is reflecting the notes that are coming through, and I'm not going to go through the tweets because you're all saying it uh, in person here. Uh, hi, uh, Shebnam Kalamni. Keep going. Okay, Shebnam Kalamni Olskan, Coach University and Harvard University. I would like to provide two links, one on access, cap access to capital and virtual jobs and motivation and virtual jobs. On access to capital and virtual jobs, um, so I work on a project funded by Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation about mis misallocation of capital in Africa. And, you know, our task is to interview firms and, you know, young firms, you know, older firms, multinational firms, local firms, and try to understand, you know, why they are not hiring young people. And one topic is, you know, came across is this, you know, whole virtual arena. And there, what is important is they cannot get financing to start a business. It is very small money that we are talking about, and they can organize, but they just can't go and get financing from the banks because they don't have collateral. So here, I think the link between the access to finance, access to capital, and virtual jobs can be industry, but it's also important it's government and institutions because if the property rights and institutions are not defined, they won't be able to, to access it. Thank you. Can I go to table 11, please? Roy Jacobs, you've just made a rather important comment here uh, about uh, introducing a Facebook-driven internship program and your experience, particularly when it comes to the virtual environment. Tell us what you do and uh, just summarize very quickly, please. Yeah, so we, um, in our search for good interns, uh, what we actually... What do you uh, do, please? So we post it on Facebook. Uh, no, what do you do? What? Oh, sorry, I'm from Philips, CEO of Philips uh, Middle East Turkey. Um, and in our search for interns, so we changed our strategy to move to a digital approach uh, in combination with still going out to universities. But most important it is the dialogue, actually, that it triggers um, whilst we are ongoing. So we have now 20 interns through the new program. Uh, but most, uh, or the best learnings that we get is also the ongoing dialogue online on Facebook with the new generation. 
um, about potential uh, issues that they have, um, uh, return on uh, or feedback on our brand, but also what we can do to engage them in our work. And quickly, what conclusion are you with, uh, drawing from this change to the landscape? Uh, that actually this is the way for us moving forward. Um, so it has been a very successful proven. We are going to expand it. Uh, also uh, going more digital in, uh, in other recruitment areas. So Thank I you. think it's, it's kind of uh, adding to the virtual dialogue uh, that this is a new way in where you go directly where, in my, in my view, the most important is where the community is, where they have their dialogues, and then when you engage with them, you can get them on board. All right, we have five minutes to run, sadly, um, but I knew this was going to be a problem. We're just take, getting to lift off stage here. Fouad, your reflections on this discussion. David, as well, please. Thanks, Nick. I, I think the... Uh, I would like to link the recommendations of the B20 again back to infrastructure that governments should not only focus on hard and economic infrastructure, should also focus on the soft infrastructure. You know, the infrastructure that's consistent with the discussion here. I mean, if we are, if we are gonna push virtual jobs and virtual communication, we need to have the infrastructure that allows this to happen in a, in a, in a very rapid and uh, efficient manner too. Thank you. David, I've put the five points from the B20 task force up behind you. Um, there's nothing about virtual there. Have we just focused on one issue which became quite sort of fashionable in the last 40 minutes, no, or is it actually the, something uh, rather important? I think the conversation here today has been the most pragmatic I've heard at any of these sessions for 10 years. The practical um, examples that have come out of today should be taken forward. This is the basis of a World of Work Marshall Plan. We need this fleshing out, the detail putting in, as Jamie says, the real examples from on the ground, built in, proliferated, and sent out there virtually, so that we develop the virtual world of work for young people and the practical and physical world of work for young people. This needs fleshing out. These ideas need to be pumped in to the B20 process today. Is it about politicians or is it about enterprise? Is it top down or bottom up? In the absence of speed of implementation from the political uh, environment, let's just get on with the job. <laughs> that doesn't quite answer the question, though. Is this for politicians or is it for others? This is for politicians, for top business leaders, and for people that are shaping the agenda of the economic world. We need to get it to everyone. Right. Well, I hope this is on the agenda of the plenary as well tomorrow. Wilmot, uh, you've been sitting patiently. Just try and summarize. I've tried to summarize it, obviously, with the virtual element. But what's your reflection of what you've heard? Well, I think I'll start with the tweet, which I think speaks to a lot of discussion so far. This came uh, from Saeed, and it is, future of work will be a portfolio of personalized work, not full-time employment. And so I think the discussion has focused on virtual jobs versus traditional jobs. And what we've said is, regardless of the type of job, What's important is education and training, access to finance, and the role of government in stimulating the economy, as well as providing incentives for the private sector uh, to, to, all, to, to actually advance. As well as, and more important, I think as, as importantly, uh, providing hope uh, for young people again. And I think that we've heard from the essay contest winners today about uh, their ideas. And, the whole notion of virtual jobs, Nick, Nick, I think also speaks to the fact that there is a lack of trust in the ability of the private sector and government to actually provide those jobs. And so I think an important um, notion also, which was tweeted, was it's really important to have the first job. And enabling young people to begin working, to begin to develop their self-esteem, and to feel like they are an integral part of human society, again, I think is a really great challenge. And I'd like to share one example, which um, we sort of alluded to, uh, which is working, and that is employees taking the responsibility with where you are now um, to actually seek to employ youth. And one initiative of the Global Agenda Council at the World Economic Forum was actually called uh, 10 Youth, which did just that. We challenged a thousand companies to hire 10 youth. And so as, as we move forward, uh, Nick, it's, it's important to understand that the reality of the situation is that we also exist, we're uh, in an economic context in which uh, economies are struggling. And so I think um, um, an implied question is, how important is the private sector and government willing to make youth employment 
uh, in light of the other priorities which are stressing economies all over the world at this time. Wilma, thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry to have to bring this to a close. And what I'd like to reflect to you is I think I can still feel an enormous generational gulf on this. And that's really summarized by tweet 105 from May, uh, sitting still on table one. Quote, discussion wrapping up too fast. Radical ideas for Arab world. Increase web content on skills in Arabic language. May, thanks for that, because I think it does underline, and it's great to have the global shapers here, it does underline how the traditional thinking is maybe should be challenged much more sharply by those who actually are at the heart of the problem, but also pr providing new solutions, particularly in this virtual space that we've discussed for the last half hour. I apologize it's short, but the, uh, the brevity meant that you were even more focused than you might have been. So it's great, and next time we'll, we will try and make it longer. Remember what David said, it's probably been the most pragmatic uh, session he's been to in the last 10 years. So hopefully that spirit can continue in the next two days. Thanks to you all for coming. <laughs>